All right, today we're going to be going over chapter 12. The last few chapters we've been doing a lot of stuff about consequences, reinforcement, punishment, what comes after the response that would lead to its increased or decreased probability. But we're going to go back to antecedents and talk more about how the current context affects the behavior and not just what happens after the behavior affecting future probability. So as a review of chapter 11, we talked about the different schedules of reinforcement. So more complex schedules, these will be intermittent schedules of reinforcement where we have continuous reinforcement, which is after every response, reinforcement is provided. Where these, it's a little bit different, where it might be after every three responses, or an average of every three responses, or after five minutes of not doing something, or an average of five minutes not doing something. And so each of these different schedules of reinforcement have with them their own distinct pattern of responding. And so just going over it again, if we look at fixed ratio, the number of responses is the same every time. And so if you need to do, right, you need to get one homework assignment done and then you get a break for the day, well, we're going to see you do rapid acceleration to try to get this homework done and then as soon as you finish it, you stop, right, until we need to do the next thing, boom, and then the next thing, boom. Versus if it was variable responding, you would get a break after maybe every two assignments you did, maybe after every three, then we're going to see a lot more continuous responding even after provided a uh, break or reinforcement. And then intervals, we have fixed interval, which is this, fixed, this scallop pattern, where it's every, let's say, every, every week on Friday something has to be done. We're not going to see much responding for it on Monday, Tuesday, maybe Wednesday it starts picking up Thursday, Friday it's got to be done. We see an accelerated rate of response leading up to that final time it needs to be done, which is that scallop pause kind of uh, pattern we see. And then we have variable interval, so on average at the end of the week. But sometimes it's Sunday, sometimes it's Wednesday. We're not going to see, it's not going to be as steep and dramatic as variable ratio. It's going to be a little less steep, but we're not going to see this pause. We're not going to see this stop in behavior. You're good. All right. So those were how consequences affect behavior. But now we're going to go look into how antecedent stimulus, uh, how antecedents um, influence behavior. Gosh, I'm sorry. So as a review, an antecedent stimulus is something observable that happens before behavior. So now technically, everything that's going on currently in your environment is an antecedent. But what we really want to look for when we're studying behavior is the antecedents that matter, the antecedents that actually change behavior, right? So, and that could be, and because we're trying to find, we're trying to distinguish between what is actually having the influence and maybe more superstitious things or things that are just not, it, there's no contingency at all. Okay, so first off, we have the philogenetic and these Pavlovian stimulus controls, right? Because these would be reflexes. Something in the environment uh, s signals, it elicits a response, if, then, right? So you get a pinch on your hand or you touch a hot stove and you go away. The antecedent of the stove being hot and you touching it, right, you respond a certain way. Now, that, that's not learned, but you wouldn't put your hand away if it wasn't hot, right? So that's where the context of it comes into play. But also, you could smell someone. Uh, you just say your mom's baking cookies, you get this great smell, that's the antecedent stimulus. Now you start salivating. That condition reflex of salivation has, though the, the, cookie, the smell of the cookies have taken on this salivatory reflex uh, properties or these, this, uh, the function of salivation, right? So the stimulus, the antecedent stimulus of smelling the cookies elicits a certain response, right? 
Okay, cool. So we can see how antecedents play a role in Pavlovian conditioning and filiogenetic responses. But what about operant responses? So this is where we get into the discrimination of operant responses. When to do something, when not. When is the appropriate context to do something, when is it not the appropriate context. When will behavior be met with rein, uh, reinforcer, when will it not, right? So let's give a definition. Discriminated operant behavior is operant behavior that is systematically influenced by antecedent stimuli. So walking across the street, right? If the street's very active with a bunch of cars, you're not just gonna walk through it not looking at anything, right? Context isn't there. But if the white man is signaled on the little crosswalk thing and then you look both ways and you see no one's there, all right, now it's the time to do it. So it's not about just the consequence of I've crossed the street before, now it's, you know, crosswalking behavior has been way more likely because of the reinforcer, that is true. But what we're waiting for, what is really going to signal the availability for that reinforcer of crossing the street safely and not being hit by a car is when that white hand pops up or the white man pops up and there's no traffic anymore, right? And so this, the white man signaling you can safely get across the street is the, as we're gonna learn, the discriminative stimulus that says, okay, if this is happening, then I can walk, then reinforcer is provided getting across the street safely. Right? Okay. Also, we see examples of this in Halloween, <laughs> trick or treating behavior. Now, let's think all back when we're kids, we're really excited, we're trying to go get candy. This neighbor's house has these awesome light shows. We see kids coming in and out, right? They've got decorations, their lights are all on. And then we see one house with no lights, no decorations, nothing, no one going in and out of it. At first, if it's our first time trick-or-treating, we might go up to that house and there's no response, right? We knock, no one answers. We go up to another house with no lights. We knock, no response. Then we go to a house that has all of these lights and people moving in and out and there's foot traffic and we knock and we get our candy. So, now it's Halloween, right? You're supposed to just knock up, knock on a house and get candy, but under which context? When the lights are on, not when the lights are off. The lights being on is the discriminative stimulus signaling that reinforcement is available if you engage in this behavior, whereas if the light's off, it signals something else. It signals that there won't be any reinforcement provided, basically extinction. Now this would be st uh, an S delta, okay. But this is a cool Halloween example we can all relate to, but in terms of pigeons and rats, mice, the same thing is replicated in an operant chamber where the foo or the pellet, or sorry, the key pecking behavior has been uh, reinforced with a light in the box when it's turned on, but no pellet is provided for that same response when the light's off. And as we could imagine, food, um, uh, button pressing behavior continues and is maintained when the light is on, but after a while, when the light's off, the pigeon stops pecking. The light being on, just like the example with the Halloween houses and trick-or-treating, the light being on is the discriminative stimulus signaling that reinforcement will be available if that behavior is engaged in. And if the light's not on, this would be the S delta signaling that no reinforcement will be provided, even if the response is engaged in, right? So discriminative stimulus, SD, is an antecedent stimulus that can evoke a specific operant response because the individual has learned that when the SD is present, that response will be reinforced. When the neighbor's house with the lights are on during Halloween, if we knock on their door, that's gonna be reinforced with candy. If the lights are off, that response won't be reinforced because they're not going to answer and we won't get the candy. Right? Is this making sense? If lights are on, or so the discriminative stimulus is the lights are on. If we knock, then we get the behavior, or then we get the candy. If the lights are off, that would be the S delta. And if we knock, 
then we don't get candy. And we could see pretty clear as day the behavior of knocking on doors with light versus knocking on doors without light. We're going to be knocking only on doors with lights on and we're not going to be knocking on doors with lights off. Unless maybe we see some kid just coming away from the house with the light off or something like that that we might think, oh, okay, something else. But okay, so more examples, like I just said, the, the Halloween example, the pigeon example. Uh, do you have an example of when, in this context, if you do something, it will work, but in another context, it won't? Okay. Well, let's think about uh, food. So you're looking for a food spot, and you see your fa the restaurant you want to go to, and it says open on it with the light on it says open well then if you go there the consequence is going to be you're going to get the food but if you're looking for this restaurant and you drive by and it doesn't have it op the open sign on if you go and knock on the door you're not going to be met with food right interesting right so no one's answering maybe and this would be we would probably see uh, extinction bursts and extinction variability because let's think about it. The signal is there. The discriminative stimulus is there. Or the, yeah, the discriminative stimulus is there. It says open. Come on in. Historically, this has signaled that reinforcement is available. You engage in this behavior. They don't answer. But you see the lights on. You're like, what the fuck? The sign says open. So maybe you knock harder. You walk around the building. Things you wouldn't normally do to try to get the food. You have variability in your response. You might get a little mad. What the fuck? Why isn't it open? It says it's open. Fucking <clears throat> kicking everything. Right? Right? Maybe you go to the drive through It says it's open, and then no one responds, and you're sitting there, and you're annoyed, and you're like, what the fuck? And you drive around three times. Yeah. Right? And so if that happens enough, maybe you stop believing that that restaurant is actually open. Right? But for the most part, that, can you think of, that would be a good example, but can you think of anything else where if this thing is on or if this is happening, then it signals you, can, you should do the thing and you'll actually get the intended consequence? Right, if someone puts up like a caution sign? Okay, interesting. Uh, let's see. So, like, maybe like a caution when wet sign? Yeah. Where. Let's say the caution when wet sign is the discriminative stimulus where... Um, if it's up, don't walk across it and you won't fall. I don't know. Right? So I guess the consequence we're trying to think would be to, in this case, it would probably be um, negative reinforcement in the form of avoidance. Right? We're going to avoid this slippery thing. So it signals that... Um, the caution sign is there, okay, so if we walk around, then we will avoid the slipperiness. And if it's not there, we, I guess that is an interesting thing. Like, I guess, like, if the sign's up, you approach, and, like, if you're paying attention, you see the sign, you're not going to fall. But then, I guess, the sign's not up. And you approach, then you slip it in your head. Because then, like, like you said, I guess avoidance. Right, so I'm trying, I'm trying to think how this could work. Because there's, there's. It's like light on, light off, sign up, sign down. Yeah, sign up, sign down. But then it's like, okay, so the sign up would be the discriminative stimulus where the sign's up. Yeah, if you. Well, let's say if you walk through it, then the consequence is you slip. Where it's not off, if you walk through, then you don't slip. So maybe the sign is actually signaling of maybe punishment, where if yeah, you... That example. What about like a stoplight? Okay, a stoplight. That would be really good. It, let's say you come to a red light, right? So, it's 
So red light, you approach it, the consequence would be to stop. But then it's like, if the stop... Well, the consequence wouldn't be stopping. The behavior would be stepping on the brake to stop. The consequence would be avoiding a crash, avoiding a ticket maybe, um, stuff like that. And so if it's a green light, and so there's multiple contexts to look, to look at this under. If the antecedent is it's red, if we stop, then the consequence is we don't get in a car accident. Versus if it's green and we stop, then the consequence is we're getting honked at, maybe we get rear-ended. I don't know. It's interesting. I'm, I'm not like, it's, it's a little bit harder with those examples, I guess. But you're doing good. You're thinking. You're thinking. OK. Now, the S delta is what I mentioned before. If this is in the antecedent context, it's signaling that reinforcement won't be provided. That if you usually do something like, you know, if the, rest, if the sign on the restaurant is off, right, then food won't be available, right? So the S delta is an antecedent stimulus that decreases a specific operant response because the individual has learned that when the S delta is present, that the response will not be reinforced, right? You go to your favorite restaurant, the sign's closed, shoot, right? That's signaling that you're not going to be able to get your food. So um, another interesting example with this, we can tell uh, about facial expressions, right? Let's say you're at a party and you're feeling flirtatious. You're looking around. You're seeing who's giving you the eye. If you see someone who's giving you this kind of flirty, kind of intrigue and look at you, well, that's probably the discriminative stimulus that signals, hey, if I go up and talk to them, I might get a hug, a kiss, whatever kind of intimate reinforcer we're thinking of. <laughs> But if we're looking around and we see someone, we make eye contact, and they gave us like a disgust, ugh, kind of look, that most likely is going to be an S delta. It's signaling that she's not interested. If you go up and talk to her, she's not going to give you the response you want. She's going to brush you off, right? And so the S delta is signaling when, if we were to do it, the desired consequence wouldn't actually happen, right? And so after time, presented enough SDs, we just or discriminate or S deltas, we will learn, right? And this is the idea with contin um, building these contingencies. It takes practice. Over time, we'll get more fluent and we'll realize we'll be better at picking apart, discriminating, and generalizing between faces of attraction and faces of disgust. Oh, I'm like super. I blacked out on this. Oops. OK. So now we talked about when the discriminative uh, stimulus signals behavior will be reinforced, how the S delta signals behavior will not be reinforced. Then we have the stimulus, the SDP. So this is an antecedent context that decreases the specific operant behavior because the individual has learned that it will, in the presence of this SDP, be punished. That response will be punished. So now let's think. You're at a red light, and it's taken a while. You're thinking about going. You're thinking about going. And you're about to, and then you see a cop across the street. Well, now this red light running behavior decreases in frequency because you know under this context if you run it you're probably going to get a ticket right so you don't do it the likelihood that you'll do that behavior goes down right this should make sense so this is kind of like a warning stimulus and i guess this would be more so the example we would get you, we were trying to get to with the caution when wet sign this would be more of like the warning stimulus of if you do this behavior now, you might have this aversive consequence of slipping and falling, right? Okay. So we understand if-then behavior, this two-term contingency. 
And we've talked about the three-term contingency, so we'll, we'll go into the three-term contingency a little bit more. And I really hope I'm like lit up enough on this camera. So the three-term contingency is the relationship between the antecedent, so the context before behavior, the behavior, the actual response of the organism, and then the consequence, what happens afterwards. So the discriminative stimulus, the S delta, the SDP, all of these things are part of the antecedent context, right? There's something that's going on currently that is going to signal and give rise to the probability of other behaviors. So, right, the antecedents also have an effect on the probability of behavior, and so do consequences, right? Consequences affect future probability. Antecedents affect current probability. Okay, so now, it might sound a little bit similar. Similar, a discriminative stimulus, right? There's something in the environment that signals the availability of a reinforcer. It might sound a little bit like establishing operations. When we talked about motivation, there's a current context which makes the value of a reinforcer more likely and the probability that you will act to get that reinforcer more likely. But there's a big difference. They're very related, but there's a big difference. Right, the, dis the, the discriminative stimulus, discriminative, discriminative stimulus, I'm sorry, all right, it's different. The discriminative stimulus, like we said, would be the, the sign on the restaurant saying open. The establishing operation, the motivation part, would be going all day without eating, right? Now, put both together, we've gone all day without eating, we're super hungry, now we're basically kind of looking for these discriminative stimuli that are signaling the availability for us to satisfy our need, to function for this desired reinforcer. Now, if we're satiated and right, we have an abolishing operation on, or we don't have this establishing operation where the food as a reinforcer is more likely and we'll do more probabilistic things to get the food. Let's say we just ate and we passed the same restaurant with the same open sign on. Well, unless it's very habit driven, we're not going to stop, <laughs> right? And so just because the SD signals the availability for the reinforcer, we still need to look at motivation, which is a deeper context that gets to if we're going to function for that reinforcer or not. How valuable is the food? Because if we don't really need food, if we're not hungry, but there's a stimulus in the environment signaling the availability for food, it doesn't matter if we're not going to take it. Right? If I just had In-N-Out and I love McDonald's and I leave the In-N-Out parking lot after eating, stuffing my face full of cheeseburgers, and I drive past the McDonald's, probably not going to stop. I'm satiated. It's open. It has all of these signs that say the reinforcer is available for me if I go and go through the drive-thru, but I'm not. So there's a difference. They're connected, but they're different. Okay, so now we'll talk about discriminative discrimination training. And a little example to relate it with applied settings in kids with autism. Let's say we want to teach the kid the difference between cars. This is a car, this is a truck, this is an SUV, this is an 18-wheeler, right? At first it's all car. This is car. Okay, cool. All right, we're getting the, the basic class of what it, the stimulus is, maybe automobile. But when we get to it, we want to s present the different options. We want to present a car, a truck, an SUV, an 18-wheeler, a moped, a motorcycle, a bike, all of these different things, and for them to be able to say, what is this? Bike. What is this? Car. What is this? Truck. Because they all kind of look pretty similar, but having the correct response to describe each one, this would be discrimination training. Right? So this is the procedure of reinforcing in the presence of the discriminative stimulus and ex putting an extinction procedure on all responses for the S delta. Right? 
So we have the list of four cards. We have truck, car, 18-wheeler, SUV, right? We present all four options. I pick, I say, point, show me the truck, right? And then we're about to get into prompting. I say, show me the truck. If they point to the car, I don't make a dissatisfied face. I don't try to punish them. It's nothing happens, right? We don't provide any reinforcement. We're super neutral face. We don't do anything. We give a second to reset, and then we give the prompt again, or we, get, we give the request again, the demand. Show me the truck. And now we might wait for them to try to do it again. And if they're still wrong, then we might come in with prompting, where we might have a gesture prompt, where we might like look at something or like point to which is the correct one. Or even better yet, move if they're all laid out on a row, we would just push the truck one a little bit closer to them so it's it's primed by proximity, right? It's closer to them, more likely to pick it. And then we would gradually fade the prompt. So let's say the kid needs help at first being able to point to it. it they can't even point to it, right? I say, point to the car. They don't do anything. I would first start with the least amount of prompt I think would be necessary. So maybe it would first just be a gesture, like a gesture, like mm, a point. Okay, that's not it. I'm going to represent again and say, show me the truck, and I'm going to go one more. Maybe this would be me actually bit doing a, uh, I don't know, maybe more of a, uh, I think I already just said gesture. But maybe I do a partial physical prompt where I start to take their hand and bring it closer to the right one. And when I get close to it, I let go and let them push it, let them actually touch the truck card. Cool, then we provide praise, yes, we give them the token for their token board. Awesome job, kiddo. We keep doing this until they have it mastered. And for us, our program, it was, if they could do it for three different trials, or if they could do it, not trials, but um, three different times, so a, a, t a block of 10 trials over three days, if they got 90% on each 10 block over those three days, we would say they mastered it. And then we would go through throughout the course of the program and reintroduce these uh, learned, conditioned responses to just upkeep, to maintain them, and to also have the discrimination so they can still learn the difference between this thing and the new thing that they're learning that's kind of similar. We still want to train that discrimination between them. But, and we're, we're about to get into more about the prompting, but another example of discrimination training, say we're a baseball player, right? We only want to swing at strikes and we don't want to swing at balls, right? In the presence of a strike in this little area, we swing. If it's outside of this area, we don't, right? And if we swing when it's a ball, we get a strike. Punisher, don't do that shit. <laughs> Stop swinging when it's high. Stop swinging when it's low. Stop swinging outside the zone. Come on. You wouldn't want to fucking swing when it's right in the middle. What are you doing if you don't? Come on, your coach is yelling at you. The fuck are you doing? All right? <laughs> TSA, right? They need to be able to flag the objects that are actually knives and guns and bombs and not flag the ones that just kind of look at, look like them. All right? So this is all reinforcing the response in the discriminative stimulus, the presence of the discriminative stimulus, and not in the, the context of anything else. Okay, so discrimina discrimination is, like we just said, responding only in one context and not another. Generalization is when we respond the same way in similar contexts. And this is a gradient like we see on this graph. This would be the generalization gradient. And the point of stimulus discrimination is to make this curve tighter and tighter and tighter where we only see this responding on the exact stimuli that we want, right? If we only want to respond with a certain key peck when a yellow light appears, we can condition that pretty easily. And we'll see that in a pigeon when this yellow light appears, you peck, cool, okay. Well, let's say we start with the very lowest wavelengths and we present we got green, we work up to kind of a lime, and then we get yellow, and then we get orange and red. What's the responding gonna happen? We don't see anything at green. A little bit of responding at green. 
a little more the more we work towards the, the actual stimuli we were originally conditioning. And then we see great amount of responding and then we slowly tow off. But there's still this responding uh, to the stimulus that's not the exact one that we were originally conditioning, right? So this would be the generalization. So generalization occurs when a novel stimulus resembling the discriminative stimulus evokes the response, despite the response never have been, never have been reinforced in the presence of the novel stimulus. The novel stimulus just looks like the thing that we've been conditioned to respond to in a certain way. But it's not the real thing. But there's this gradient. And like we said with PTSD, this gradient's way bigger. That's another thing. Thus, P patients with PTSD, why it's so hard, it's even though red is not the same color as yellow, and we can see here, responding drops off from yellow to red. With PTSD, those responses are still high, right? Not for colors, but for their triggers, right? And when we would do a uh, discrimination procedure, we hone it in so that we see less and less and less responding and only responding right at that exact stimulus, right? And that would be the point with the cars, right? The car, the SUV, the truck, the 18-wheeler, they all look pretty similar, but they have different names, right? We need the kid to be able to differentiate between each one. Another thing, um, phantom vibration. A lot of us have our phones in our pockets, right? And it'll vibrate. We'll pull it out and look at it. Cool, we got a text or we got a call. Other times, we won't have our phone in our pocket. And we'll feel a buzz or something and we'll check to see, huh. Or maybe our phone is in our pocket and we feel a buzz, but it wasn't our phone and we check it anyways, right? There could have been some, there was a, a stimuli that resembled somewhat the stimulus of when your phone buzzes. Similar enough to that we check our phone. That's generalization. And discrimination training would be to hone in and refine where we really ignore these kind of weird buzzes that we think are our phone, they kind of feel like it, training to ignore that and only actually pull out our phone when it really does buzz, right? All right, stimulus response chains. So this is where the consequence of the response is now the new setting and the new antecedent for the next response. So it's, the, it's a fixed consequence of operant responses and each evoke the new discriminative, discriminative stimulus for the next response. So shoe tying, right? We could think, right, you have your laces, you flap them over, then you do the twist, then the other bunny ears, and then you pull them or whatever. Well, you're not gonna do the first initial thing and then try to go right to the bunny ears. There's a step in between that, right? And so this was what chain behavior is. The, after completing the first step, it is now the context which signals for the next step. And it's very fixed. You can't skip between parts in the chain. It's very meticulously ordered. And so example for kids with autism, comb brushing behavior, teeth brushing behavior, like we just said, shoe tying behavior. All of these things have a fixed chain of responding that needs to happen Boom, 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 right? Okay, so how do, we, how do we condition this chain behavior? Well, first we gotta run a task analysis and see what is the actual chain and really break it down as far as it needs to be broken down to. Because sometimes the chain is very simple, right? We don't have to break it down too much. Shoe tie, it could just be flip, flap, flume, fling, pull, <laughs> right? But with a kid with autism, who might be severely debilitated, it might require a lot more descriptive of that chain of first put the hands in, then grab a certain time, then push it. The more precise that chain is, we're gonna have to be more precise with that chain the more debilitating the kid's autism is, right? But okay, so now we understand the exact chain that goes into the behavior. It's first this response, then this, then this, then this, and this, and it's boom, 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 until the terminal completed behavior is done. All right, how do we teach this? Two ways, we could start with backwards chaining or forward chaining, and depending on what we're trying to teach, one could be more or less useful, but both work, 
right? Some are more preferred for certain situations and behaviors than others, but both work, right? Backwards chaining, we start with the very last thing, make them proficient in that very last step in the chain, and once they're proficient at that, then we work to the step before. And then they have them do the second to last step followed by the last step. And then once they have that one, two, punch, knockout thing down, we go to the third last response and then have them do the third last, second last, last. Then the fourth last, third last, second last, last. Right? So starting with the very end behavior and working backwards and finishing the chain, but starting from the back end. Right? Versus forward chaining is the exact, exact opposite. You start with the first thing, and then when the, when the first behavior is nailed down, then you add in the second. Then you add in the third, then the fourth, all the way down. Okay. And so, like I said, when we're trying to teach this kid with autism how to identify the truck, the car, the 18-wheeler, all these, between all these pictures, I say, point to the thing. Well, if they don't move, if they don't point at all, I'm going to prompt them. I'm going to literally grab their arm and move it closer to the thing. And if they still don't do it, I'm going to represent and I'm going to do a full physical. I'm going to take their arm and make them touch it and make them do the behavior and then provide the reinforcer. Give them the token. Good job, kid. And we gradually fade that. So we're using a less and less intense prompt. So it first starts with full physical. I do the whole thing for you. The entire thing I'm doing for you, and then we pro provide reinforcer. And the goal is to gradually fade the prompt so that now I grab your hand, but I bring it close to the thing, and I let you touch it. Cool. Then I maybe grab your hand, move it a little bit, and then you do the whole thing. Then maybe I just kind of model it, point myself, or maybe I gesture or do something else, or maybe it's just a verbal one. Like when we're trying to teach kids certain sounds, this was always really fun. They uh, point to, or I'm, I'm trying to, I'm forgetting the example off the top of my head, but we would say the word for them partly. Like, let's say we wanted them to say flower. I might, they're struggling with it, I might say fl, and then they say flower. Or they can't say anything, and I say flower. Though I say the whole thing, and then they say it. Cool. And then I gradually say flower, and then they say flower, and then I say fla, and then they finish it, and then full, and then they finish it, and then just, and then they finish it. Like this is this is the idea of a prompt. When you forget something, it's on the tip of your tongue, and you just need someone to say, "Shit, man, give me this something to remind me of what I'm trying to talk about." They say the thing, and boom, oh, like, man, it's on the tip of my tongue. I know it starts with some letters, and they start to say another letter, and they're like, oh, that's it. That's a prompt, right? And that's it. So I hope this lecture really broke down more of the antecedent involvement in, in behavior, where it's not just about reinforcing and punishing and the consequences. Right, everyone, oh, let's focus on the consequences. Well, there's more to it than that, right? There's the whole first half of the equation, which is the context, okay? Like we said, we could be satiated, right? In abolishing operation on food, we just ate, we're no longer hungry, food isn't functioning as a valuable reinforcer, our likelihood of doing anything to get food is decreased. Driving by a sign where it signals the availability of food, that's a discriminative stimulus signaling the availability of the reinforcer, but is it probabilistic that we're going to do it? No, right? Because there's more to the context, right, than just what has happened past as a consequence influencing the probability. We have to also focus on what's the current context influencing the current probability, right? All right, that's it. So I hope we enjoy, and we're getting pretty, uh, pretty close to being done with this series. I think we only have maybe three or four chapters left. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Peace out.